Blog Talk Radio. everyone to today's Earth Energy Forecast show on this March 26, 2019. I hope you're having a beautiful day. It's very beautiful here today. Brilliant sunshine, nice blue sky. Thank you for joining us today or if you're listening later in the podcast. What a Mercury retrograde month this has been. That's all I can say. Uh, I don't know if you're having the issues I've been having, but this is one of the most challenging Mercury retrogrades I've experienced. And I've had numerous issues with cable and Internet. And thankfully for my sister's hotspot, I'm able to do the show today. (laughs) I'm so grateful for that. Um, And also dream time has been really rich and dreams that take me back to uh, things that I thought I had worked out before, to rehash, redo, rethink, revisit all the re's of Mercury retrograde, and just weird dreams, and, you know, this Mercury is still conjunct Neptune in Pisces, and I cannot wait until it starts moving away. Uh, It won't go direct until the 28th, so it'll go direct this week, but it'll still be in shadow until, like, mid-April. So we're going to learn more about that next month, uh, the first Tuesday of every month, Jude Valentine. Yes, Jude, that was on the show before, she's going to return the first Tuesday of every month, Astro News with a Muse, and she's going to talk about the energy of the month and, uh, and talk about this conjunction of Mercury and Neptune. But for today's show, and this is going to be a really rich show, I have anthropologist Dr. Beth Hagens on, and she's going to discuss her experience and work with Earth Energy Grids and how the grid lines map the current situation at the border between the U.S. and Mexico. Beth Hagens, Ph.D., is a lifelong explorer and craftsperson. Her work since 1972 as a university-level anthropologist has taken her to six continents. She has a broad base of professional music experience in violin, mandolin, and a variety of indigenous sound-making instruments. It was through the generosity of Christopher Burr that her earth grid work expanded. Industrial designer Bill Becker opened her eyes to geometric visualization and mysticism. Her research also includes bull roarers and plasma energy. Beth Hagens holds a Ph.D. in anthropology from the University of Chicago and is currently on the public policy and administration faculty at Walden University. Her website is Beth, that's Beth with an E, dot missionignition.net, and her email to reach her is Beth with an E, dot Hagens at mail dot waldenu.edu. Welcome to the show, Beth. Thank you. Welcome to you, too. <laughs> I, I really like your introduction about uh, Mercury and rec- retrograde. It was um, interesting that as soon as you invited me to come on the show, I uh, took it as a time to go back and really revisit my thinking. And um, it's it's changed. And that was thanks to your invitation. It was really what I needed to get kicked out of the going back and going back and not coming forward. So thank you. You're welcome. Well, I know today's show is going to be jam-packed with information, and it, it is about your experiences, about traveling the Earth Energy's grid. So, so let's start there, Beth. So what are, if you can explain to us, what, what does the word grid mean, and what are these Earth Energy grids? Well, I think they got the name grid 
um, because if you look at a traditional globe, you know that there are latitude and longitude lines that cross, you know, to make those little rectangles. And um, the first grids that I ever found out about that weren't those little rectangles were um, from Chris Bird, who was in um, the so- or in the Soviet Union in the um, very early 70s when a group of three Russian uh, people kind of like us, I guess, you know, middle-aged, um, looking at things, curious about spirituality, um, wanted to follow up on Plato's geometry. And um, if you think of the earth, earth in as having a set of lines on it that looks more like a soccer ball than a than a cage of trying of rectangles, that was what they were using. And they found out that if they followed the broke one of those broken lines um, by pu- by putting it on the earth on their globe in a specific way, one of them traced right down the mid-Atlantic grid or mid-Atlantic ridge in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Are you familiar with that? Yes. And he said that was what started the whole, for them, the whole exploration into does this geometry of Plato, which I call if it had a reality in the Earth. And so those lines and the geometry on the Earth, Chris called the Earth Energy Grid. And that's where it came from. Oh, very good. So, so this grid might look like um, not like a grid that you would think of as as um, grid on a piece of paper with lines going horizontally and vertically, but it but where those lines cross, they might form different shapes, such as like a hexagon. They might, just like in a soccer ball, where the uh-huh. seams are. That it's a grid kind of like that. Yes. Yes. And so what's the grid like around the earth then? Is it, is that what it looks like? And, and, and is it, um, do these lines correspond then to an energy out, out above the earth? I don't think they do. That This is the part that I've been really rethinking lately I wish we had a. We don't have any pictures, do we? I guess not on the radio. But um, uh, we we have the ones that you provided me, Beth, on the show page, so that people, if they're listening now, they will see it on the show page. That's playing now. If you if you have a if you have a globe, and you just look at the path of the Mid Atlantic Ridge, you what you see as essentially are the edges of three. Uh, five-sided figures coming together to create the the kind of a zigzag pattern down the grid or down the down the ridge. This is so hard to say, um, but there are in in Plato's geometry there are five shapes that have the have sides that are identical. The, the cube is the easiest one to explain because it has four sides and four corners or six sides and four corners on each side. Right. Does that make sense? Now you can yes. take and put, you can put a round, a round ball around a cube and you would have eight points where the, the corners would fall in that circle. Mm-hmm. Now imagine there's another figure that has triangular, has four triangular sides. You could center that, um, symmetrically inside the cube so that the points of the of that that figure would also fall in the circle. Does that make sense? Okay. Or on the sphere rather. Yes. And yes. In, in the it's end so- you have you have a you have just have a very symmetrical looking set of of meridians essentially going around the earth. Fifteen mm-hmm. meridians. That creates mm-hmm. this pattern of triangles. Mm-hmm. We talked about meridian lines last week with Peter Shampoo, um, and the, are those meridian lines similar to ley lines that that have uh, particular energies? Well, I just treat them as meridians, meaning that they cut the Earth in half. 
Okay, different I, different term for meridians. Okay. And he uses he he draws meridians, but I I really believe that the energy of the lines, if there is energy, comes from interaction of life on them and recognizing them, rather than there be than them being some uh, thing that's fixed on the earth. It just happens that I I picked up this one grid from Chris. And Chris Bird, and it's reality in the Russians' idea that the edges of this dodecahedron went on the Mid-Atlantic grid or Mid-Atlantic Ridge when they had the two tops of the form centered on the North and South Poles, and they mm-hmm. put a mm-hmm. real lot of energy into that belief, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. that figure, you know, it it was circulated all over the world. People started to believe it. And it's almost as soon as you start looking at the patterns, you start seeing them. And right, for a long right. time, I thought that for a long time that they were, um, you know, somehow radiating out of the earth. But I think that they are um, a process of intelligences interacting and sharing and meeting with difference because people find there are so many kinds of grids and people can make an equal argument for a, for a completely different position. That's why I'm kind of hedging on what the energies are. Mhm. Mm-hmm. And just for people, a dodecahedron has 12 faces. So with these lines, then if we're going along with, if this is true, if I'm following you correctly, Beth, that let's say, for example, the North Atlantic Ridge. So we're going along with um, geographical features do they always follow these geographical features? And what would happen if, let's say, there's um, a large earthquake or we go through a pole shift and, you know, we, we know that the continents have shifted before? How does that or does that change this grid? Well, the grid is, a, as I said, I think it's a matter of belief. I don't think that the energy is as much in the earth as it is in the sharing of beliefs about the earth across a lot of time that gets carried in culture and carried in people and animals. And that the beliefs... So we are the grid. Yeah, that's what I believe, that living organisms are the grid. And and then you get to that point and you say, well, the earth is a living organism. Right. And so, you know, but... And you can't separate anything either. (laughs) No, and, and but that's what's so wonderful about it, because people see this. They have so many ways of seeing it that um, it's almost like I welcome different ideas about the, just like the one you said about what happens if, if we have a, a slide of the crust. What happens to the grid? Do, you know, like, I, I would think that if I was still alive and my place shifted, I'd probably go to the new place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it wouldn't change my it wouldn't change my belief about my spiritual experience at the place. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that then the consciousness level of you know uh, of the planet of the people on the planet does that then as that changes does that then change this this grid? I don't think that it will, I mean, the reason that I'm so committed to this grid is because I spent about 10 years of teaching with my students where we were looking at it. You know, we were constantly looking at it. I think I told you I had my students go in, um, instead of assigning a textbook in my anthropology class, I I assigned them a globe. And um, they had to uh, plot the simple 15 meridian grid and then see what they saw. That was all I told them. And the first year that we did it, um, Chernobyl had that terrible accident in outside Kiev. That was, that was on one of the major grid intersections. The um, Great Pyramid turned out to be on one. Um, The Valdez oil spill happened on one. You know, it seemed like the more that we looked at the grid, the more things we saw in the intersections and the lines. Interesting. And so then, as I when I started publishing it, 
people would write me and say, well, I really like your idea of the grid, but I moved it five degrees, and look at this. Look what I found. And so I'd have the students um, look at that grid, but they were kind. Of, they had already kind of bonded to the one that we started with, and so they would keep saying, well, there's more on our grid. But really, now, I think people, there's so many ways that you can see things that uh, the, the infinite number of grids, I mean, I know about 10 of them now, and that's probably minor. Um, they make the earth more sacred because people care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what are the other ones, just for example, what's another one like then? What are the other grids that you know of? Well, there's one that's that's totally of triangles, small it, it works from an icosahedron, which is the, the figure that has 20 equal uh, triangles that they cover the earth with. And um, he positions uh, not, not the point of the, not one of the points, but he puts the center of one of the triangles on the, um, on the top of the earth. And then he divides it up into infinitely number of small triangles. That's um, John Sinkowitz. And that grid got a lot of following. And then some people use chakras, which they put on, and they, they are in really sacred locations um, that were on, in places that they thought made sense as um chakra points of the earth and so you wouldn't really call it a grid but it is in the same it, it's kind of like ley lines and uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. and J.J. Hurtak who wrote Keys of Inic has a grid and, right um, right yes yes you know, so there's a lot of them and now there's a guy we have one that's on Google Earth I don't know if you've seen it I made it just this little KMZ file that has the, the grid that or it's a geometry that Buckminster Fuller proposed that has 121 meridians instead of just 15. And Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that I'm using in that map that I sent you. But a fellow has taken that and he's made it mobile so that you can put it on the earth and move it around and see if you find different lineups. And that's where a variety of grids are coming from. That's interesting. Isn't it? Wow. So what do you mean by he's making it mobile? Is it actually um, lines that they're drawing on on the earth? That they're, they're, uh, I'm trying to visualize this. Well, you know the one that Christmas. I have, the one that I sent you that has all the different colored lines coming out of the, the intersections? Yes, and that should be on the show page. That covers that actually covers the whole earth. You can you can see it on. I can send you, anybody who wants the the file for it. I can send them that file, and you just you open it up in Google Earth, and boom, you have our grid right there on Google Earth. Well, he's found a way to take that so that you can open up his file, and that container will be there, but you can move it around and see the lines positioned in different places. Okay, on the Google whole, Earth. Okay, the page yep. stays the same. And they call that the wow. mobile UBG grid. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> I think that's really cool myself. Mhm. Mhm. So, I in looking at your website, and there's there's so much information there, and I encourage everyone to go there. I did see um, that you do talk about consciousness. And um, you, why do you say that consciousness is breath and sound contained in spin? That's a good question. I, I did a tremendous amount of yoga for the past 15 years and started to realize that um, – I could become calm and do my work if I really paid conscious attention to my breath. And um, at the same time, I had uh, gotten just enthralled by bull roars. 
And um, I don't know. I think if you have the you have the sound clip, but maybe people have heard of them. It's just you get the same effect if you um, tie a string on the end of one of those old-fashioned wood rulers and swing it over your head. Yes. That's a bull roar. And um, people have been made, it, they're, they're stereotyped as being, you know, like from the Southwest or from Australia, but they're actually, I haven't found any place where there wasn't a bull roar in the history of humans. There were some in Europe that go back 40,000 years and they were made out of um, either antlers or, bo- or bones. But um, the way the bull roar goes it makes a it makes a sound like an out breath, and then it stops just for an instant and makes a, and makes an in breath. And so the whole phenomenon of bull roaring, which is probably the the primary consciousness instrument of most uh, pre-industrial societies, um, was the bull roar, and they swung it at times of um, when you were kind of crossing, crossing a threshold, you know, like if you wanted to get pregnant, if there was a child being born, if you were going to get married, if you committed a crime, if your crops were failing, if your crops weren't growing, if um, you were, you died, it, the bull roar was always there breathing. And, um, hmm. And so I got to thinking of the bull roar as kind of synonymous with the, um, what I think is almost grid points in consciousness. And I thought you were breaking up there for a little bit, Beth. Could you repeat that? You were breaking up a little bit there. Um, is this any better? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you go out, but uh, the last part of that sentence we didn't catch. Um, the bull roar is a is a sound of breath. It's a it's a phenomenon of connecting with the divine. I see breath as a as essentially the essence of consciousness. And so I see the bull roars and breathing and um, focusing in the chakras as you breathe as consciousness. And so the mm-hmm. the bull roar seemed to me like a spiritual technology that um, facilitated focused consciousness. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's as, as breath. Mm-hmm. And, and these bull roars have to be spun in order to make this sound. And that's where spin yeah. comes in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you when you they're tied to the end of a string, and as soon as you as you swung them over your head on the string, they start spinning, and then they get to a certain point where the string winds up, and then they stop for an instant and go the other direction. Stop for uh-huh. an instant. Uh huh. You know what I mean? Right and left. It's quite interesting because last week I had Eric Thompson on from Subtle Energy, uh, and he was talking about, and I can't remember the gentleman's name that came up with this, but he used this in his work that said that everything in the universe is spin, and it's either a right <laughs> hand or a left hand spin, you know. And I, and so there's these themes that keep coming up in the show, and <laughs> and that's I just, curious. It, it didn't go past me that you know you were going to talk about bull, bull roarers today, and that Eric had brought that up, and that's how he, and everything is energy, and that's um, how he taps into the the vacuum, and um, is able to you know I mean it's it's a proprietary way that he does this, but his work is taking and capturing the frequency or the energy, everything's frequency. And uh, being able to amplify it and then uh, encode it into digital digital form. So that's wow. that's that's interesting that you bring that up. Do you think it'd be useful if I played the the clip now so people could hear what a bull roarer is? Sure. All right. This is just a seven second clip of what a bull roarer sounds like. So I'll play it now. <laughs> So I think that gives everybody a good feeling for what that's like. So for that seven-second clip, did that bull roarer then, for that first, did it stop and then go the other way? Yeah, that's exactly it. 
Uh huh. So that was like a full cycle then, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I think you got another, a full cycle and then another um, in breath. And another in breath. Okay. Yeah. And do they when they when the indigenous use this tool, do they do it in a way that? Um, you know, I'm imagining they do it in an honoring way in ceremony. And do they count the number? Is it dependent on what they're working on? Do they use it in that way, or just curious? It's it's not used in the same way in all um, in all groups. Um, I know the um, Santa Re- religion uses it. Um, they use a small one that sounds almost like a dragonfly and it's just meant to be back I haven't ever been to a ceremony so I can't say for sure but my friend who who told me about this said that um, the divine feminine is a dragonfly and their bow roar sounds just like a dragonfly and so it's 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 breathing or making that buzzing sound in the background to kind of hold the um well, we could call it the consciousness or the spirit of the group. In um, other parts of Africa, uh, I only know Nigeria. They're very dangerous instruments, and they're brought out when somebody wants to um, incite uh, revenge killing. And so they're not a beautiful spiritual thing. They're to gather and to consolidate and to enact what's considered to be justice. In um, in the eight the late 1800s in um, East Australia, in one of the groups, they would um, use very sharp bull roars that they would bring to um, male initiation ceremonies and uh, swing the bull swing the bull roars and sometimes use them to uh, circumcise the and sub-incise the young men. As the tool uh, itself to do the circumcision? Yeah, yeah, the bull roar was was used as a knife. And Mm -hmm. um, what I'm working on now, I have been for about the past 15 years, is trying to to, um, see if I can show that the flint bull roar up um, in the Arizona area, which was... um, there's a lot of evidence that it was not wood, it was flint, and it was used mm-hmm, to herd cattle mm-hmm. and to bring rain. I think that the um, the obsidian tongue or knife at the center of the Aztec calendar is a bull roar. Yes, I saw that on a document that you had sent me. That's That's so interesting that the nostrils, and again, connecting with the breath, from the face was yeah. where they would put the string to swing it. Yeah. Well, I've made, I made, um, there, I don't know what you would know that we call them sometimes spinning wheels, but the ones that have the two holes in the middle and they're round, they're about six inches circle and you can, um, run a loop of string through it and then pull it back and forth and it'll spin up and then pull it, you know, and you can yes. go back. Mm-hmm. That's the center. I made one of those out of exactly the form of cuts from the um, center of that Aztec sunstone. And it's a fantastic bull roar and it breathes, or I mean, spinner. I think it's the companion instrument. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in a lot of parts of the world, they have that spinning wheel with the two nostrils in the middle, along with a bull roar. And they have the same name, not everywhere, but someplace. That's really interesting. Do you have, as an anthropologist, do you have any evidence that these these indigenous peoples shared this information, or was it something that they all did on their own? What I what I really think in my heart of hearts is that the bull roar arose with weaving. And if I had to think Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. anybody who would have invented them, I think it would have been a little kid sitting at its mother's knee, driving her crazy with the shuttle. (laughs) And and taking it with the, you know, whatever yarn she was using and spinning it. Uh uh 
so that it could have been discovered everywhere. I don't think it has to have been discovered by one because it's just everybody discovers it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's so but interesting. But there are a lot of the, – the traditions in Australia – and in the um, Southwest U.S. are so similar, it's um, it's astonishing. I, I feel like that connection will one of these days be um, be validated. It's just incredible how similar they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can understand in the Southwest why they why they u- would have used flint or some kind of a stone because there's not a lot of wood to be had in what there is. Uh, the mesquite or, or the juniper, whatever, is very hard and yeah. well. Hard you're giving to... exactly the reason that they why um, I decided not to be a mainstream anthropologist because they said, well, of course, there were no borers found in Mexico. They didn't have any wood, and you know, there's the borer <laughs> out of the hardest rock in the world sitting right in front of them, and they don't recognize it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it does make. Sense. <laughs> you want to hide something? Where do you put it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that that's great. So, these bull roars are used for so many different things. Has anyone adapted it for modern use? Well, Mickey Hart, my hero. Well, tell you me more him? about. No, I don't. Oh. Joan, he was one of the drummers for the Grateful Dead. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I know the Grateful Dead, but I don't know all the names of the members. <laughs> that was my initiation into life, the Grateful Dead. Um, <laughs> but he wrote, he has a book. I, I really wanted to understand drumming. And so I got his book. I think it's the one that it's in is Drumming at the Edge of Magic. And he talks in there about bull roars and he said that he has one and that when he um when he really wants to go go out he sits on he swings his bull roar for 15 minutes and is gone and i kind of like a shaman's I, drum or rattle yeah yeah i haven't got the strength to do one for 15 minutes yeah, yeah. Uh, just seeing the video, and it was um, the one you sent me from. Uh, what's oh, the Crocodile there? Dundee. Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, I mean, most people, if they're old enough, would remember Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> <laughs> and he used a bull roarer in one of his uh, one of the movies there. Yeah. yeah, it does look like it takes a little bit of energy to do it but for a if while. You, if you do that one, you know, like that they use in the Santeria. Um, it's just a little thing. It's not. It's maybe four inches long, and it weighs about um, oh, gee, not even an ounce. And I could swing that for fifteen minutes if I wanted to, but I haven't, and I don't know why. Mhm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. oh. The one that you made, the circular one, on the string there, the, um, the spinner there, that might work. Well, that one has a different um, a different quality to it. Um, it's uh, it's associated with the um, goddess Hecate. Have you run into her? The I've fly. heard of her. I don't know. Yes. Well, but at, it, when she's in the uh, the crone stage, she's Hecate, and she um, she is always shown with one of those spinning wheels, and um, as it goes in and out. I felt like she she sends her energy out and then calls it back in. That's what I see as the reversal of direction of that spinning wheel. Mhm. Mhm. But it doesn't make the same sound. It makes the sound more like the wind. I see. It kind of goes, mm-hmm. shh, that kind of a thing. Mhm. Mhm. A softer sound. Yeah, and not hard to do at all, but. You know, once you get the rhythm, it's just, it's almost brainless. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. Because but you, usually you go women into a don't, trance state. Women don't usually spin bull roars. I don't know. It's, they're not forbidden to them. In Africa, you're not supposed to see them. And I was told that in, um, I was over in New Guinea in, in the early 90s. And um, 
I was told that before I went that women were not only not allowed to see the bull roars, but supposedly they didn't even know that they existed. And I stayed with a with a woman who had grown up in a tribe but had moved into town, and she told me, "Oh, that's silly." She said that they would, if they would break, the hole in the end would break, and it couldn't be used anymore. They'd throw the thing in the woods, and the girls would go out and pick them up, and they used them to um, set on their lap and cut an even edge on their grass skirts. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know, so there's a whole lot of mythology there about who knows what and why and who it's like Santa Claus. I mean, not really, but you know, like that kind of a thing. Yes. Yes. Uh, as an analogy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so they pretend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it is. So you were talking about this spinning, the spinning wheel and all, and it made me think of, of, um, the spider woman in, um, uh, out in the the southwest and uh, the native traditions about her weaving the web um, would this web be could could the spinning be somehow weaving or or interplaying with or mimicking the weaving of the grid the the earth grid itself? There, I think you're you're definitely on to something. I um, the fellow that I mentioned earlier, uh, Gary James, who's uh, who's been helping me so much with my um, health, told me a while ago that Spider Grandmother was the um, electromagnetic shield of the Earth, and if you go to um, a site called Suspicious Observers, their logo, you look at it and you think, oh my gosh, the electromagnetic field looks just like a spider. Uh-huh. And um, So if the spider is a function of, of mitigating the destructive force of the sun for the energies of the earth, then yeah, I, I think it makes perfect sense that the grid, whatever that means, maybe it's energy potential. Whether it's in, you know, maybe it is in lines, you know, maybe the belief in lines. I don't know. That, that's the one that really um, fascinates me. That holds the most juice. It's interesting. I'm going to have Ben Davidson on the show coming up in April. Oh, are you having <laughs> from, him? Yes, from Suspicious Observers. Yes, so we'll be talking all about, <laughs> all oh, about the fantastic. upcoming pole shift and and the theories behind it. And, yeah. Yeah. So that's really juicy information right there. I mean, you could go into that. And and, um, (laughs) so, yeah, could bull roarers then mitigate (laughs) uh, the effects of the upcoming pole shift, right? Um, But you also, speaking of which, you also talk about sacred sites and and how we can manipulate the Earth's electromagnetic field uh, at, at these sites. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, give me an example. What did I tell you? So, um, well, can I treat? Um, ask me a little bit more about the question. I'll be sure I understand. For example, um, let's let's talk about Stonehenge for a moment because that's circular. Um, was that sacred site developed to either hold the energy? Or at a point on the ley line, you know, like uh, when Benny LeBeau did the acupuncture on the earth, was that an acupuncture point? Is that holding some sort of energy, uh, the electromagnetic field around the earth, you know, something like that? And did they do ceremony there? Maybe even with bull roarers, who knows? I don't know. But did they do ceremony there? Because it is circular. And what what went on there, and what could we do today at these sites? Oh boy, that is a good question. And you I don't know, know about you know about Stonehenge, maybe you know no, I'm, some I'm of the pyramids. Of, you know, there's pyramids oh, all I'm, over the earth. Well, I don't know the I don't know the way to talk about them that. Uh, I mean, I sure read about them all the time because the changing uh, nature of what's 
what Stonehenge is and what it was keeps changing so much. And I know that the um, intense amount of uh, spiritual energy put in it, into it by just my generation and the ones following about what it is, what it could do, what it might have meant, triggered a whole um, a whole revolution in the way we see the world. So, you know, there's a function of Stonehenge that we never saw before, that it would unite the global culture in the way it did and, and the significance of Stonehenge to alignments with other places so that you really do grow a connective energy that is sacred. That's one way I look at it. With the pyramids... Mm-hmm. Um, and the placement of stone, uh, it happens that the Great Pyramid is is near the first the first intersection on the grid that the Russians identified, and um, it's another one that's that's been catalyzed by the media since the 20s and made made very important. And it again, it's it's attuning people to sacredness in the world and to the acceptance of ideas and, and mysteries other than our own, you know, which I think is incredibly important in healing. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Among the Maya, their pyramids, um, this is research that I haven't seen for a long time. I got it out of a book in the 1800s where they were finding the pyramids. They weren't big, but they were there, and they were built uh, in a pattern of hexagons. The, the pyramids number. were. You you broke up again, Beth. I'm sorry to. I don't know what it is, you, but, but you broke up again. Well, but it's, it's Mercury retrograde. I know what it is. So <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. So these pyramids you were talking about, these Mayan pyramids. Yeah, they were just small ones, but they were built as if you had a hexagonal grid on the ground, and you put pyramids at um, each of the the corners of the hexagons, just like a like a beehive, and the pyramids like a mountain would collect water in the center and there were pipes coming out of the bottom of them. And so I wondered Mm -hmm. if they Mm -hmm. were, I wondered if they were just, you know, like sacred in the sense that water is sacred and the pyramid shape drew the water or Uh the same thing will happen with a great big stone. You know, there's so many ways to look at this stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then, uh, their, their rights that maybe what they did, um, Water may have played, like you said, it, it is sacred and, and played an integral part in whatever they did there. Uh, that is interesting. I, I didn't know that about the Mayan temples. Well, they, they aren't. And you know, the Chinese were doing that. What I, If I had another life, what I would do is go over to China and work on that um, pyramid that's buried about a mile from the uh, that tomb that has the uh, clay soldiers in it. Have you ever seen or read about that? No, I, I think don't know about that at all. Tell me a little bit more about that. Oh my gosh, it, I wish I could pull the name of this place up out. But there's a, they have 10,000 clay soldiers guarding the first emperor of China buried. It was, it was brought, it was first discovered, I think, about 1970. Now it's, anyway, there's about a mile from it. They they know that there's a buried pyramid, and there's a mythology created, you know, like around that pyramid. That if you could get inside, the emperor is really buried in there, not where the clay soldiers are, and that the ceiling is painted with the stars, and that there's a lake of mer- of mercury in there. And so with the they're really? the Chinese, yeah, the Chinese are proceeding really slowly. Because they don't want to disturb the the pyramid if it's actually under there, you know, it's all all of this is being taken from really more carefully reading their ancient documents. And this time, with that, almost exactly matches the time when the um, the pyramids were built at Teotihuacan, and there's one there that has that they've already discovered has a mercury lake at the base with the landscape just like the Chinese one's supposed to be with stars painted on the ceiling. And mercury, uh it's very it is a metal, very metallic. It would reflect these stars then. Yeah. Would you get a reflection on, on the 'cause on the beads of mercury? And where do they get this mercury? 
And how did they handle it safely? I I know it's but you know, like all this stuff is waiting to be but it's the same time, you know, and they're still denying that yeah. the Chinese were over here. But there's no in my mind there is no yeah, question. There's no question. Those yeah. Are yeah. connected. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes, so I kind and, and of go to those kinds. Of I saw that when I was out in the Southwest, too, the connection between the Asian culture and the Native American culture in the Southwest. To me, there's no doubt in my mind that I think the continents were connected at one time. And, and you know, and there was – there's just I, – and I, I don't have to tell you. You're an anthropologist. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen the similarities. Um, so we haven't so – so that we have enough time to talk about this, let's switch gears a little bit. And talk about how the grid lines map the current situation at the U.S.-Mexico border. I, I find this interesting. Well, this this is my discovery just for your show. <laughs> um, oh, okay. <laughs> no, seriously. You'll only because, hear it here, people. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's seen this except for my, my husband. But um, I about four years ago, I got into really uh, – I wish you could think of the man's name. He wrote a book about um, granite in the Northeast and how it um, could increase seed fertility. And so I installed this enormous granite garden in our backyard and put um, trying to nourish the bugs and the birds and the bees and the butterflies. And so I'd been watching... uh, MSNBC <laughs> a lot and uh, heard about the National Butterfly Reserve that was um, threatened to be uh, destroyed by the new wall. So I thought, well, I'm going to look that up on the, on the grid and just, I wonder where it is. And so it was right on one of the grid lines. Mm. But it was, a, it was a minor grid line. But I thought, isn't that interesting? Because I seem to look at things you know, like if I decide I really want to go look at them on the grid, they're generally on it. So I thought, well, I'm going to look at that. So I watched I, I, that picture I sent you. If you go from that yellow uh, stick pin, you go up the Rio Grande, it follows a grid line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of curves around the, um, around the intersection up by Pecos. Yeah. Texas. Texas and that Texas, white... Yes. Yeah, that line that Pecos is on that goes over to what's called UVG-17, that is the major southern grid line in the United States. There's very few crossings of these major white lines because that's what, that's a piece of one of those 15 equi- or meridians. Yes, and, and just for the um, listeners, that, that picture is on the show page, and, and, the, and it just, it'll keep going through these different images, so you, you will see that image. Okay, Beth, go ahead. Well, that, it was significant to me, Pecos, initially, because when I first went there, um, my Bill Becker, who I was with at the time, um, told me that he would divorce me if I published that Pecos was the site of the most delicious and huge cantaloupe in the world, <laughs> and that Ronald Reagan <laughs> ate one every day. <laughs> But, you know, I liked stuff like that. We had another fight over in Arkansas, or at, in yeah, in um, Arkansas, over the um, world's largest trout I ever caught on a grid. <laughs> on a grid. But I, <laughs> he said, you can't publish that. That's not. But um, <laughs> so anyway, we de- I liked the the river detoured around Pecos, and then I thought, well, I wonder where the troops are stationed. And so El Paso was right on that major grid, white grid line. Mm-hmm. And Ohio was. Uh-huh. Yep. And, and all that white places. line goes right along the border. So that the border is the energy now of what I think of as uh, the energy of the point number 17, which you can see it's just, you know, like under, under 90 miles from Sedona. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This everything that's on the map, the Area 51, Sedona, the Grand Canyon, um, all of those tribes in there, White Sands testing grounds. Yep. It's been really, to all these places. You're saying, <laughs> yeah, 
I, I was just nuts about this. But here's the weird thing. If you go from, you just follow that, that white line west, or I mean east, you'll eventually come over to the, the Bermuda, what they call the Bermuda Triangle good point. Oh. And if you back up to Florida, guess what that white line runs through? In Florida? Yeah, just take a wild guess. Um, Jeb Bush is home. <laughs> Mar-a-Lago. Oh, Mar-a-Lago. Okay. Well, I knew it had to be one of them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but I just thought, isn't that funny? You no, know, Gallas, El Paso, and Mar-a-Lago all on this one oh. grid line. Wow. That, that we could say a lot about. <laughs> But, you know, like, this is the thing about the grid that drives me absolutely crazy. If you go up from the Bermuda Triangle, there's only two other major major segments of lines that go through the U.S. One of them goes from the Bermuda Triangle literally right through the center of Washington, D.C. Now that and makes the sense. other one. <laughs> I know. And then one goes. It's never, never land. <laughs> That's what it felt like to me. I couldn't believe it. And <laughs> if you go, if you follow that one up to the um, into, into Alberta, there's an, a major um, intersection up there that that lies on that same green line coming out of out of, 50, out of 17. If you follow one major from there, it runs right through the big Boeing construction plant. Oh my gosh! So this is really literally tying all these. <laughs> All these pieces together that are kind of starting to um, collapse at this point. Yeah, it's interesting. Isn't it odd, though? It's wild. I have a question just because I've been out. I, I lived in Sedona. I, I've been out in, in at Chaco Canyon, and I had a weird experience out near Shiprock. Is there anything like a Bermuda Triangle out there? <laughs> just wondering. Well, was it a good weird? Uh, I, I guess it. I lost time from when I. I so here's my story. Um, we had with my friends. We stayed at Chaco. We we all had this spiritual experience there that I, I will save for another show. But we're leaving. I'm driving, and we're going back to Sedona from Chaco Canyon in in northern New Mexico. And all of a sudden, I get really ill. And I'm getting like dizzy and nausea, and I'm like, okay. And my friend says, I'll drive. I'm like, okay. I get in the back seat, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, we're, <laughs> we're at Shiprock, and I'm like, <laughs> and an hour has passed. And I thought I went into like a meditation. I'm not sure. Was I abducted? I don't know, but I lost time. I'm like, how did we get here? It was like I just lost all sense of time. Like it can't be. It was just 10 minutes. I just, you know, that's what it felt like to me. And that was traveling at least an hour. Well, it was at least an hour drive. So people get an idea of where that was in relation to Chaco. Just wondering, uh, there were so many I, weird I, things that happened there. No, but, you know, when you look at the amount, this is where, you know, like when I was trying to talk about the energy of, of place, the amount of energy that is out there naturally in terms of uranium and uranium tailings is, is unbelievable. You know, just, just adding the Earth's energy to all this. And, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and plus all those tribes, I just... I just learned that when they um, when they re- resettled resettle is the wrong word when the um, Navajo were removed from their uh, their their lands they were cultivating churro sheep you know they they'd been they'd had them since the the fourteen late fourteen hundreds or something really long time these beautiful sheep and the um, our people went in. And in front of those Navajos, before they sent them on their own uh, walk out of that area because they wanted it for coal, they slaughtered the million sheep in front of them. Oh, my gosh. And the, those sheep 
were they they knew up to eighty members of single families of people. You know, like they recognized their faces. They were that intelligent. Mm. And when when I look at that area, and I you know, there's all the nuclear waste and all the the children with. Um, you know, that have been born with Downs and um, the testing grounds and whatever White is going fans, on. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's, it's a, it's a, it's no wonder you lost time. But I mean, I mm-hmm. think that that, mm-hmm. that point, that 17 is the same energy as the one at Giza. If you, if geometrically it's the really? same. Time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah and because I they say the that there is a um, – sorry to interrupt. But they say that in the Grand Canyon, there is something that connects over to Egypt and the pyramids and the Great Pyramids. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. It's, it, it, has the, um, it has the same kind of energy. Now, those points, mm-hmm. there's, there's um, 30 of those geometrically evenly spaced around the planet. Interesting. And I think that they are the, I always thought of them as the areas that where energy was um, symbolic and communicated. You know, when you hmm. look at the Middle East situation, you know, it's, it's, it's just like this. It's got the same amount of, of crap in it. It just is kind of hidden here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More, the board this is really bringing this to the fore, that we've got our own Middle East crisis right here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So getting back to that line that goes, the grid line that goes along where they're proposing to put the wall, what would that mean then that if we build the wall on that grid line? <sighs> well, what is your heart telling you, Beth? <laughs> My heart tells me that if you build a wall, you are going against everything that positive life energy is about. Mhm, mhm, mhm. I, I, I. I mean, I, 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 we don't have to talk politics, but I think it's one of the more horrible things that we've ever done. Mhm. Well, just from a, a even a, a feng shui perspective, you know. Uh, of looking at it energetically when you when you make angles or you block energy you know uh what happens you're blocking the chi you're blocking the energy and there's a build up there's a stagnation uh and then and then the way energy works uh, eventually it has to release you know, I, I usually just talk about things in terms of energy because I, I can very easily see and, you know, manipulate that. And, and I'm like, OK, you know, it's just going to build up and then boom, you know, and then a release. And, you know, because things are always tending towards um, towards harmony and balance, kind of like, you know, the, the vector equilibrium from Buckminster Fuller. You know, I yeah. mean, you know, everything is, is morphing and changing, but but at the core of it. It's really this this harmony and balance out of chaos. And harmony well, and balance for me in my heart is like that always wins out. Yeah. And I know I think that it's strange. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say I, I know that um, your former partner worked with Buckminster Fuller. Yeah. That's so interesting. Can you share a little bit about that? Um, his ideas. He was a he, he was a I um Buckminster Fuller was was a strange man. I will say that. Um, what what I what I took away from him from Fuller was that his uh geometry you know, is identical to Plato's. Mm-hmm. They have, they had exactly the same, um, the same notion of, of the spheres and the, and actually this, you know, all the, all the crisscrossing lines are the major 15 circles. They're all a, a model of Buckminster Fuller. 
that's called the icosahedral great circle set that Bill seemed to think was was the one that we should use because um, part of that, when we were first learning about the grid and we tried it out, it ran up that thing called the Michael Mary line in, in England. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. we used that and we just, we made it up. You know, we just said, this is UVG geometry. And we just thought, okay, we're going to put this out there. It had, you know, that was, he'd worked with Fuller. He thought that we'd use that model. But Fuller, even though he traveled around with that big um, globe, he had an earth globe that was about eight feet, eight feet in diameter, I think. And, wow. Wow. Um, yeah, he, he traveled with it, and it was the same shape as our basic grid of the 15 circles, but he, mm-hmm. he always said that the, the lines and the intersections had no meaning, that it was the geometry that was important. He gave no spiritual importance to it. Hmm. That's interesting. Isn't it? But he was yeah, really because... interested in the idea of the dihedrals, you know, that, that you, if you had two halves of a circle coming together that the half, each one, each one of these lines on the grid, because every single one of them is an equator that cuts the earth in half. Right. And so right. I always saw that as the tension of the dihedral. And that somehow that was liminal or it was, it was threshold or that boundaries, you know, have that energy. Mm-hmm. And so he proposed models, Fuller proposed models, that um, of something not not unlike this, where he said there are these tensions placed on the earth as having there the are these tensions you broke up again, Beth. There's these tensions. Uh, t- what, what did you say after the tension? Well, do you know the word liminal? No, not in the context. Well, imagine of imagine that this this line here between us and Mexico, you know, this that, that it's that it's a straight line, and there's a there's a tension. If that's if that that white line continues around the the Earth as a circle, that there's a certain tension of the halves of a circle being connected together, mm-hmm. even if it, and so they're they're constantly pulling together pulling apart and in the middle, in the threshold zone everything happens and he saw that as the flow of energy on earth but he just didn't put it in any particular place he was more working with molecules uh-huh i don't know whether that's answering your question though fuller well, I... fuller really didn't like margaret mead <laughs> I don't know if you remember Margaret Mead, but yes. I knew her. I knew her when I was in grad school, and um, Fuller was over for dinner one night, just once, and um, you know he wanted to have his own room and where his dinner would be served, and he wanted you know steak and two two stalks of broccoli and this and that to drink, and so I brought his dinner okay. in, and he said, "Well, young lady, what do you do?" And I said, "I'm an anthropologist," and he said, "Well, your life is useless." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I so I I I thought it was really odd that I would end up using one of his models. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so he didn't think too highly of women in other words. <laughs> or well, anthropology. I think it was anthropology. I think it was anthropology. Okay. I'm just wondering about either. the Margaret Mead thing too. So but uh, I think they were but, both heroes at the time. Mhm. Mhm. You know, back in that time period. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Is there anything else you want to... Huh? Go ahead. Go ahead. What were well, you I wanted to... I, there were a couple people that I just wanted to alert uh, anybody listening to. One of them is Julie Ryder. Do you know her? No, I don't. It's R-Y-D-E-R. She has a, um, she has a website, and she is working on something called Montana Megaliths. Uh Uh-huh. And it's one of the most interesting projects I've come across. If you follow that major green line going north-south out, you know, through the Grand Canyon and up, it runs through western Montana. And she has just, she has been tirelessly going through the um, mountains out there and coming up with just, Unbelievable, either natural or constructed megaliths. 
Wow. Yeah, it right seems like we're finding more and more of these um, sacred sites, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Now's the time to unearth all of this, literally. <laughs> Well, this stuff has been standing, you know, like it, it made me think, you know, when they talk about the stones, like in Baalbek in Lebanon, um, they're supposed to weigh like 320 tons, and how did they move them? Mm-hmm. Well, either, either they're, maybe they're natural. I mean, they look, but I look at Julie's stones and people up there in Montana, and they say, oh, no, those, those are obviously natural stones. And you look at the same thing someplace else, and they say, no, that was made. That was constructed by humans. They did it. And so there's this kind of uh, cultural stereotyping about was or was not happening over here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But her, she, I, that was, the, the stuff she's found is pretty incredible. And um, yeah, that that's probably it. Well, this has been such a rich and <laughs> uh, really informative show. I'm so grateful that you came on, Beth. Well, I hope it wasn't too uh, garbled up. I get excited oh. talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> if anything garbled, it was just. <laughs> The, the internet connection and that's fine. I mean, we're just going with the flow here and the mercury retrograde and the mercury in the, in the, uh, in the pits there. <laughs> that's interesting. We Can I tell you one that. just really brief thing to kind of sum it up? Yes, that'd be wonderful. Well, um, it has to do with the, with the story of Gaia. And um, I tend to go back to some of the, you know, common things that I learned when I was a kid and um, Gaia I think of as the whole divine feminine and uh, she was alone at first and then she uh, she created Oranos to be you know the father of her children but when she was that that figure of Gaia Plato refers to as um the mother sphere or the nurse of becoming or the divine feminine. He uses a lot of terms for this is in the, um, the text to Maeus. And mm-hmm. he describes mm-hmm. her as this geometric form that we used for the basic grid. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, Gaia has a daughter who is Namazni. And Namazni is the goddess of memory. And so the the geometry lets things connect from it, I think of it as if you're interested you will connect to the geometry and once you've connected to the geometry you have a memory of what's there and it's meaningful and it sustains your interest memory sustains interest and Namazni's daughters were the arts and sciences, the muses, mm. and uh-huh. what I and that's how I think of this whole process of interacting with Earth energies. That you start with the the energy of interest. You search, you remember, and it's not worth just remembering. You have to act on it. And whether that's by art or science or whatever. That's, I think, yeah. what keeps the energy going and growing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and that's mm-hmm. why I think it's so important, whatever we do on the on the border there at 17, because I think you're absolutely right. And if the, yeah. if the action that we take is negative, it's um, it's just like you said, it's a block. Yeah, yeah, we could block in the energy. Yeah, so everything is formed from, you know, the sacred egg the circle, the sphere, the flower of life that we find all across the world <laughs> yeah. and, and from which all the platonic salads are formed. That's true. The mother is that. That's it. And she connects, she bends, you know, and, and allows things that shouldn't, even at the molecular level, that uh, without that flexing of this, this basic sphere that he describes, you know, and the, the flower of life is part of it. If it can't flex, then um, 
it can't accommodate, but the way it's set, it does accommodate. And like even molecules that really shouldn't be able to connect to each other, within that context, there's an avenue for, for flexing a little and getting connection, which I love. Mm-hmm. 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 Everything is connected. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, okay. Beth, for coming on the show. I so appreciate it. And yeah, was, um, yeah it, it had a great time. Great time Me with too. you. Me too. Talk, we'll I'll talk, talk to again you. some more. And okay. I want to thank all my listeners today for being here with me on the show. If you like what you hear on Earth Energy Forecast, please follow the show on the show page. Just click the follow button. And it does um, cost some money to run this show. And if you'd like to uh, help defray those costs, I'd appreciate it. You can just go to my website, joanserio.com, J-O-A-N-C-E-R-I-O.com. Right on the home page, you'll see the icon for this Earth Energy Forecast show. And below that, there'll be a donate button. Thanks again, everyone. Have a beautiful rest of your Tuesday.